All right, uh, we are going to start with uh, Laplace transform and we were discussing in the previous class that Laplace transform is a, it preserves all the information of the original signal. So there is a bijection between the space of signals and the space of Laplace transform. Um, and while I was, uh, so I went back uh, in order to come up with examples of transforms that do not preserve the original signal. And the one transform that came up was discrete cosine transform. So you can go and look up the Wikipedia page. So discrete cosine transform is a way to transform a signal so that the information content is lost. Okay, Some amount of information about the signal is lost. It was proposed, I think, in 1976 or somewhere around that time. And it, is, it was then used for a lot of signal compression problems. So I'm sure you have heard of JPEG, MPEG, and MP3, right? All of you have heard of these, uh, these codecs. So this one is for images, this one is for movies or videos, and this one is for songs. And all of these are, so you have the original signal, you take the discrete cosine transform, you get these three file formats. And these are lossy transforms, which means that some amount of information about the original signal is lost when you, uh, when you store the signal in these three formats and many more formats. Okay, So these are all lossy transforms. And Laplace transform is not a lossy transform. It preserves the information in the original signal by the very nature. So I have a function f from r to r. It's a signal. Uh, and I have that integral of ft e raised to minus sigma 1t dt is finite from 0 minus to infinity. Then I can define the Laplace transform L of f as integral 0 minus to infinity e raised to minus st ft dt, real part of s is greater than sigma 1. And sigma 1 is, of course, greater than 0. OK, this is the definition of Laplace transform. And what we are going to do today is compute Laplace transform of some basic signals that we use a lot in control theory. And then we'll talk about transfer function and uh, move our discussion back on original discussion that we were having in the previous class, which is linear systems theory. So let's start with the most basic function the delta function, Dirac delta function. So anyone remembers what a Dirac delta function is? Sorry? Impulse. Impulse. Uh, infinite height and zero width. It's? Infinite height and zero width. Yeah, infinite height and zero width, but the integral is one, right? So it's like a limit of function that goes to infinity around 0, but has the integral under curve is equal to 1. OK, so it's a mathematical abstraction of an impulse. Um, so what's the Laplace transform? It's integral 0 minus to infinity e raised to minus st delta t dt. And this is equal to e raised to minus s0, which is equal to 1. OK? Why is that? Well, integral of g of t delta t minus t naught 
dt by definition is equal to g of t naught. Okay, so this is this is the definition of the delta function, and so I'm just using the definition here to conclude that the Laplace transform of a delta function of an impulse function is equal to one. Okay, any question? Okay, so this is the most important function in the controls class. The second most important function is step function. So actually I shouldn't put t here because Laplace transform is a function of the signal itself, not evaluate signal evaluated at a point. So the step function is defined as one t greater than or equal to zero, zero t less than zero. So this is the step function. So what is this? What should the integral of e raised to negative st be? Well, it's e raised to negative st over negative s evaluated at infinity minus evaluated at zero. So what should that be? It'll be zero minus one over minus s, one over s. Okay. This is the Laplace transform of a step input. You have a question? No? Okay. All right. Uh, let's consider delta t naught as delta t minus t naught. Then, and t naught is positive. t naught is greater than zero then the Laplace transform of delta t naught is what? Can someone find out and tell me what the Laplace transform of this is, delta t naught? Yeah, so what would be the Laplace transform? What would be the function? What should this look like? Yeah. Yeah, it would be e raised to minus st naught. And this is again by definition. So I, instead of putting zero, so this was t minus zero, so I put zero here. This is t minus t naught. So I'll put t naught here, and so the Laplace transform is e raised to minus st naught, okay? Where is this? Uh, so perhaps you already know the uh, reason why you are studying impulse and step. So impulse is exciting the system at for a very small amount of time and then just uh, not doing anything about it. The step is constantly exciting the system in the sense that your input is constant. It's equal to one. But where does delay appear? in the control system or in general in, in, in real life, where would you see a delay like this? Any thoughts? Yes. Sampling. Excuse me? Sampling. Uh, 
Yes, so in sampling you do see delay. Uh, so you have a function ft and you're sampling at t naught, 2t naught, 3t naught. Then what you get is a function g, which is f of kt naught and delta t minus kt naught. k equals 0 to infinity. Right? So that's what sampling does. You sample the function at specific time, multiply it by delta function, that gives you a new signal, which is a sampled version of the original signal. And this sampling is, of course, used in a lot of systems that are not controlled by circuits, but actually controlled through a microcontroller. Because microcontrollers or computers in general, they require sampled data. You, you cannot stream continuous data and get continuous output uh, in, a, in a microcontroller. So sampling is used uh, heavily in computer controlled control systems. The other place where you see such delays appearing is, and we'll talk about it when we talk about stability uh, far into the future, perhaps in October, November timeframe. So there are many systems where there is a natural delay inbuilt within the system. Uh, so let me give you an example. You have the aircraft engine. You have the aircraft engine, and you have the fuel combustion happening somewhere here. But the temperature sensors are put in this area to figure out whether the fuel has been combusted properly or not. Okay, so that, but it takes some time for the air to go from this point where the fuel is actually combusted to this point where the sensors are. And that introduces a delay in the control loop because you want to use the sensor output, the temperature output, to control how much fuel is getting injected into the engine. So that adds to the delay in the control loop. Okay? Because of the natural flow, you cannot have instantaneous measurement of the temperature here because of uh, the fact that the area here is extremely hot. It's about 2,000 degrees Celsius. So you have to measure it when the air is a little cooler, and that introduces a delay in the control loop. Another place where delay naturally appears, you give the input to a microcontroller, but the microcontroller cannot compute the output immediately. It's going to take 5 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds to compute the output, and that would introduce a processing delay in the control loop. So delays are very useful. and it adds a lot of challenges to the control design, which we will study perhaps in uh, October, somewhere around October or November uh, time frame. Okay? So we'll, we'll deal with this function more often when the time comes. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Let's look at the Laplace transform of F prime, oh, e raised to minus 80. Okay. F of t equals to e raised to minus 80. So I want to find the Laplace transform of f. It's 0 minus to infinity f of or e raised to minus st e raised to minus at dt. That's equal to And this is equal to 1 over s plus a.
okay there is another um, yeah yeah sure excuse me how is this referred to like the last one was a time shift what would you consider it uh, this is just an exponential signal so it decays exponentially as time progresses Now let's say I have a signal FT with Laplace transform uh, um, given by some, so Laplace transform of F is capital F of S. Uh, what is Laplace transform of F prime? Okay, let's try and evaluate or compute what the Laplace transform of F prime looks like. So, I have ft e raised to minus st uh, differentiated with respect to time. So this is the derivative let me take Laplace transform on both the sides so I get integral 0 minus 2. Uh, are you able to see here? Are you able to see below this line? OK. So I'm going to take integral from 0 to infinity on both the sides. So I have d over dt ft e raised to minus st dt equals to f prime t e raised to minus st dt Okay, so what's the left hand side and what's the right hand side? Okay, so what's the left hand side equal to? Sorry? The derivative and integral cancel, right? Yeah, the derivative and integral cancels. So what you have is ft e raised to minus st at 0 minus and infinity and on the right side, the first term is Laplace transform of f prime. Oh, and the second term is minus Laplace transform of f. What would this be? So this is f infinity e raised to minus s infinity minus f zero minus e raised to minus s zero. And this is l f prime minus s l of f. Okay, question so far?
questions? No more questions? Okay. So this is equal to zero because e raised to negative s infinity is going to be zero. Why? Because the real part of s is strictly positive. And this term is going to be negative f zero minus. And then I add the plus lf part here. I get the Laplace transform of f prime. OK, so this is a somewhat long derivation. But uh, the final expression is pretty cute. So that's good. Any questions? OK. Now I can do this uh, multiple time to get the Laplace transform of kth derivative of f. And that expression is given by So Laplace transform, so I'm going to apply this expression again and again to arrive at this expression for Laplace transform for kth derivative of f, okay? <clears throat> if you want to prove it rigorously, you can use mathematical induction this is the k equals to one case. And assume that for k, this expression holds true. And then take k, equal, k plus one, and you will arrive at a similar expression for k plus one case, okay? And then the final two Laplace transforms that are very important in control systems are for cosine and sine. So Laplace transform of sine omega t is given by omega over s square plus omega square. Laplace transform of cos omega t is given by s over s squared plus omega squared. No, no, it's not minus. But let me check. No, there is no negative. Okay, so these signals start at t greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so for t less than zero, the signals are equal to zero. And then at t greater than zero, you have a sine wave as a signal. And in this case, you have a cos wave as a signal. And so the Laplace transforms are given by those two expressions. OK. So, so far, we have figured out that for a wide variety of control signals that we will study in this class, and which are in general very important even from signal processing point of view. Uh, we are able to compute the Laplace transform. Uh, sometimes you need to go through a lengthy derivation, sometimes the derivation is pretty quick. 
But we can compute it, and of course, there are many Laplace transform tables available online, which you can refer for more complicated signals. The next concept that I want to introduce is you have a linear system. You have the input, you have the output of the linear system. And one easy way to compute for any given input what the output is going to be, you need to understand what is known as the transfer function of the system, how it transforms. The so transfer function encodes information about how it transforms the input signal to output signal. Okay, so what is the definition of transfer function? So you have input say u of t, you have a linear system, and you have an output, which is y of t. And the linear system is given by a1 y, let's say, ak yk t a k minus 1 y k minus 1 t plus a 0 equals to b 1 or b k b m u m t plus b 0. Okay, so these are the kth derivative of the signal and these are the mth derivative of the input signal. Okay, so this is the governing dynamics of the linear system. And what I'm going to do is take the Laplace transform on both the sides, okay? And assume that y is zero minus equals to zero, y, y one zero minus is equal to zero, y2 0 minus is equal to 0 and same thing for u. Okay, so I'm going to assume that everything is 0. The system was at rest uh, at time t equals to 0 minus and then the input ut was applied at time t equals to 0 and then the response of the system is uh, evolving according to this particular uh, differential equation. And we have seen some differential equations in the context of an RC circuit, and we'll see some more today. Okay, but this is the differential equation governing the system. So let's take the Laplace transform on both the sides. I get AK S raised to K Y of S plus AK minus one S raised to K minus one Y of S plus A zero. Oh, there has to be a y uh, of t here, and b0 u of t. a0 y of s, bm s raised to m, u of s, b0 u of s. Okay, this is the Laplace transform of the differential equation. So I took the Laplace transform on both the sides. Yes? Um, what is the stuff on the very far left? This, this one? It's just the initial condition, okay? So, so look at this expression here. So Laplace transform of the kth derivative of the function it's not only SK raised to S raised to K FS, but it also requires the initial conditions on the derivatives of the function from, so zeroth derivative, first derivative, all the way up to K minus one at derivative. So all I am saying is that the system was at rest at zero minus. Okay, so all these derivatives are equal to zero, 
and all the derivatives of the input was also equal to 0. Okay. Now I can, you see all these terms have bias as a common multiplicative factor and on this right side, you see US as the common multiplicative factor. So I can arrange all the terms together so that I have A raised to, no, AK, S raised to K plus A naught into Y of S is equal to BM S raised to M plus B naught U of S, which implies that Y of S over U of S is given by BM S raised to M plus B naught, and then AK S raised to K plus A naught. Okay. So what have we done? We have a linear system. There is an input output relationship that is determined by the differential equation. Okay. Uh, since this is all in signal domain, I can take the Laplace transform on both the sides, assuming zero initial condition. I take the Laplace transform and then I see, oh wow, I can actually take Ys uh, as a common term, multiplicative term on this side, and Us as a common multiplicative term on the right side. And I can write the ratio of output over input by this ratio of uh, expressions or ratio of polynomials. And this is known as the transfer function of that particular linear system. So this is the transfer function of the system. Yes? What if the system is not at rest? Uh, then, in these expressions, you will have, uh, you know, the these terms, just like it was in the expression. And so you will, in your transfer function, you will have to make sure that those terms are there in the denominator, numerator, as well as on this side. Does that mean you can't pull out, so it's just the coefficients that you're concerned about? Can you still pull out y of s? Let me think. Uh, no, you cannot pull out y of s completely. So these will. Uh, let me get back to you on that in the next class. Uh, I'm sure it will be somewhere in the book, how you compute the, tra well, the transfer function is always, you compute the transfer function assuming these things are all zero, but the question what you want to ask is, how do you solve for the input-output relationship if the initial condition was not zero? And for that, uh, I'll get back to you in perhaps a few classes when we talk about how to solve. Uh, these equations. Any other question? Okay. So the transfer function encapsulates the information about how an input signal will be transformed at the output end. And throughout this course, we are going to study very closely many characteristics of the transfer function and how it relates to control system design, okay? 
Have you seen transfer function before in any other class? Okay, so you guys know this stuff. You should have told me, I would have proceeded more at a faster pace. <laughs> okay. So let's try and uh, compute the transfer function of some of the systems. Uh, so the first thing that I want to do is, uh, let's do op-amps. Op-amps are my favorite topic. Okay. So there is negative, there is positive. You have I1, I2. You have V1 at this end, V2, and you have a V out. And you have a ground. OK? So I had mentioned in one of the classes earlier that whenever you talk about devices, because of the underlying physics, there are constraints that the input-output equation has to satisfy. So in the case of an ideal op-amp, does anyone know what the physical constraints are for op-amp? Remember? No? Yes? Yeah, current going in is equal to zero, so I1 equals to I2 equals to zero. Yes? Okay. What does that, what does that mean for V1 and V2? What you're saying is correct, but what does that imply for V1 and V2? Sorry? Uh, they have to be equal. Okay? Because V out is supposed to be infinity times V1 and v, the difference between V2 minus V1. So, and K is very, well, not infinity, but K, which is extremely large. So, you assume that V1 is almost equal to V2. Well, in real circuits, V1 is very, very close to V2. So in ideal world, you just assume that V1 will be equal to V2, almost, okay? Infinite gain. Yeah, infinite gain. Okay. So now, this is the physics. Let's try to use this physical, this constraint that is imposed by the physics of this op-amp circuit, which I don't know what the underlying physics is, I've never studied the circuits class, so I don't know how it's actually built. But I can use this information to derive input-output equations for various kinds of op-amp circuits. So let's try and do that. I have R1, so this is grounded, this is my V input, and this is my R2, and this is my V out. Okay. Let's say the current going in is I1 and the voltage here is V1 at this particular junction. The current going in is I1 and the voltage is V1. Now, I need your help trying to identify what's the 
how do I eliminate these two variables, I1 and V1? I need to eliminate these two variables in order to figure out what the relationship between V out and V in is. So maybe you can help me with that. OK, so what is I1 equals to? V1 minus Vn over R1. OK. Now since the current cannot go into this terminal, the entire current has to go in this, along this path. So this is also equal to uh, V out minus V1 over R2. <coughs> OK? So I've used this particular principle already by assuming that whatever current flows through this line then goes along this particular path. So it doesn't enter the op-amp circuit. Now what's the second principle? V1 equals to V2. I haven't used it yet. But if I use it on this circuit, what does that mean? So this part is grounded. So what's the voltage here? Zero. So this means that V1 has to be equal to zero. So I plug zero here. So I have minus Vn over R1 equals to V out over R2. These are all functions of time, but I have suppressed the dependence. This implies that V out over V in, well, I shouldn't divide it like this. I'll take the Laplace transform on both the sides. So I have V in of S over R1 equals to V out of S over R2. And so I'm going to use that to what would that be? Any thoughts? Yeah. R2 over R, negative R2 over R1, okay? Okay, any questions so far? So there were two internal states of this particular system that was I1 and V1. We needed to eliminate these two unknowns. We used the physics of ideal op-amp to eliminate I1 first, so write everything in terms of V1, and then we eliminated V1 by, uh, according to this particular principle, so since uh, V2 was grounded, V2 was equal to zero, so therefore V1 was also equal to zero. And then we took the Laplace transform on both the sides we got the transfer function for this particular circuit. Now, we can do the same thing if you have a capacitor along one of these lines. So let's say here I have a capacitor C. So for this case, let me, 
let me do it here. I have C dv in minus v1 over dt equals to i1 which is equal to v1 minus v out over r. And this implies, again I have to take v1 equal to 0 because the second terminal is grounded. So v1 equals to 0. This would imply that v out of s over v n of s is equal to minus rcs. This is known as a differentiator circuit. So whatever input, whatever signal you put in at the output side, you will see a gain which is proportional to R multiplied by the capacitance, the resistance multiplied by the capacitance with a negative sign, and then the derivative of the input signal. Okay. Now that I have one minute, I'm going to show you what an integrator circuit looks like. So I'm going to put a resistance here and a capacitor here. And for this circuit, <coughs> your V out of S over V in of S is given by negative 1 over RCS. So this is an integrator. It integrates the input signal and amplifies it by negative 1 over RC amount. Okay. So what we have done today is we have understood Laplace transform, we have derived Laplace transform for various signals, and then we have derived transfer functions for some op-amp circuits. And in the next class, we'll talk about block diagrams where the handout that I've given you would be useful. So we didn't get to that today, but we'll get to it in the next class. Thank you all. <laughs>